Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Cannon. And for the Institute for Humane Studies, I'd like to welcome you to this third lecture in our series with Professor Brandon Turner on liberalism and illiberalisms. Our lecture today, the third uh, and final lecture in the series, although we will have a fourth session next time with, with a conversation uh, with my colleague, uh, uh, Brad, Bradley Jackson from the Institute for Humane Studies. It's going to be a great conversation. Um, the title of this lecture is Right Illiberalisms, Conservatism, and Reactionary Politics. And I'll just note that we will be taking questions at the end in a Q&A period. So throughout the lecture, if you have questions for Professor Turner, feel free to go ahead and drop those into the Q&A box in Zoom. And we will pose those questions after the lecture concludes. Professor Turner. All right, um, can you hear me? Great. Um, <clears throat> so I know what you're all thinking, uh, probably something like uh, whose bright idea was it to schedule this the day after uh, the election? Uh, and the answer is it was mostly my idea. Again, uh, uh, Jason and IHS were nice enough to um, allow me to redo these lectures that I normally would have done over the summer because I had to, because I had to about with COVID. Um, and I'm not sure either of us realized that it was happening today, but your initial sarcastic question, whose bright idea was it, is actually a pretty good question considering what just happened uh, yesterday or what is in the course of happening uh, yesterday and over the course of the next few days. Um, the fact is that um, Nobody really seems to know what is going on. Uh, nobody really seems to have grasped in a definitive uh, or even reasonably persuasive way what it is that Donald Trump represents, uh, what it is that this new emerging ideological structure, if it, if it is in fact an ideological structure, um, what this thing called Trumpism is, what it represents, is it nationalism? Is it something else? Nobody really knows. Um, and similarly, no one really knows what it is uh, for a major party, for the GOP in this case, to um, have become, in many ways, the parties of the party of Trump uh, or the party of Trumpism. And in fact, um, it's been a somewhat uh, uh, tragic, uh, tragically funny. Uh, process to watch over the course of the last four years, one by one, the uh, uh, bastions of conservatism, uh, various institutes and various figures in the conservative intellectual sphere, one by one succumb to uh, the siren song of Trumpist populism or whatever it is. Um, and again, I don't think I have much interesting to say about what Trumpism is. I'm going to treat him uh, in this case as uh, one species in a broader genus of things that I'm calling reaction. Uh, so I don't, I don't recall the exact title of this talk, um, something like right liberalisms, conservatism and reaction. I think that actually might be precisely correct. Um, and I mean that title, um, um, I mean it entirely. And what I mean by meaning that title is the fact that I think that there are two distinguishable things one of them is conservatism, one of them is reaction. And it's actually a problem for me that there is no ism um, that we can stick behind reaction. Reactionism, is it a word? Reactionarianism is kind of a word, but is 15 syllables long. Um, but I just wanna contrast what you might call two ideological attitudes, one of them being the conservative attitude and the other one being the reactionary attitude. And what I want to say is actually something more than just that, more than just the fact that they're distinguishable. And I do think that they're distinguishable. I want to emphasize this. And this is to the extent that this talk has a kind of thesis, it's this. It's that conservatism and reaction are not just distinct. They're not just different. It's not just that they're importantly different, right? They're different in important ways that we ought to recognize. It's that they are, in fact, utterly opposed to one another. Um, that reaction at its core uh, is radical. Um, that it's not only radical, but that it's, it's opposed to uh, 
the entire project of conservatism properly understood, properly understood as a kind of intellectual tradition that emerges in the early modern period that reaches its apex in the figure of somebody like Edmund Burke, and that has given us a legacy of figures from Oakeshott to Scruton to even John Keeks uh, uh, to learn from. That's a thing that I want to call conservatism. That's the thing that I want to spend most of my time talking about. And I also want to talk about the ways in which that thing is not only compatible with, but is actually complementary to the liberal tradition. And then I want to distinguish it as sharply as I possibly can from this, uh, not new, but this radical thing, um, which is new contemporary flavors, uh, what I'm calling reaction. I think it's largely a product of historical circumstance that we place conservatism and reaction on the same political side, right? We identify them both with the right. Um, as you probably know, we get our terms left and right um, from, again, another accident, historical accident, basically the side on which the various opposed parties during the um, constitutional debates in the French Revolution sat. Um, and there's a sense in which this thing, conservatism, um, and what would become reactionaryism, uh, they both sprang from this thing, the right. Um, but I think it's not only important to distinguish them, I think it's important to recognize that reaction has as much in common with what we sometimes describe as the left uh, um, uh, as it does with conservatism. Um, okay, so if we want to talk about conservatism, there's actually three things. So there's conservatism properly understood, which is what I'm going to spend some time talking about. There's reaction properly understood, which I'll spend some time talking about. And then there's actually, there's a, there's a third thing, which in some ways comes first. And we can just call it, um, uh, so uh, Lord Cecil in an early 20th century book on conservatism called it uh, natural conservatism. I'm just going to call it unconscious uh, conservatism. Um, Every time someone writes a book on conservatism, and this is the case with George Will's recent book, uh, or even if you look at somebody like Oakeshott, they almost always tend to start with a consideration of what they call the conservative sensibility or the conservative attitude or the conservative disposition, right? And these words, attitude, disposition, um, sensibility, uh, I think these have a nice analog in the social sciences when we talk about things like status quo bias, right? There tends to be just this presumption actually not presumption, there's this observed fact about human behavior that human beings tend to like things the way they are, particularly when things are going well. Right? So if things are going reasonably well, human beings will tend to um, adopt attitudes towards change that are, for the most part, conservative, right? If things go reasonably well, if your family is taken care of, if you feel reasonably safe and secure, and and you feel that you're better off than you were previously, you're going to be skeptical of large scale changes. So again, however, whatever you want to call that, the conservative disposition, natural conservatism, status quo bias, I mean, that's a thing, it exists, but I actually don't think it's even particularly well correlated with the attitude or with the position that I'm going to call conservatism. It seems to be universal in character, um, and from my perspective anywhere, from the spectrum of political theory, I actually don't think it's, it's that um, relevant. It's not to say that it isn't interesting, and it isn't to say that it's not important. And in fact, I think that status quo bias or natural conservatism, I think it's comparatively understudied. I think all forms of folk ideology in general are uh, understudied, just mostly because people tend to be non-ideological, at least in the kind of consistent way that we think of ideology. But nonetheless, let's just set that stuff. Uh, to the side. So conservatism. <clears throat> um, what is it? Where does it come from? When I t teach this um, to uh, undergrads, and I, I actually teach this in a number of settings, the texts that I really like to um, use to identify what is happening when conservatism seems to emerge in the 18th century, <clears throat> I like to focus on the contrast between Locke's second treatise and in particular chapters two through five of Locke's Second Treatise, much of which we talked about in our last session. And I like to contrast um, Locke's views in the Second Treatise with a figure like Hume, um, and in particular, the Hume of, uh, of his own treatise uh, and the discussion of property um, that shows up um, in, his, uh, in his treatise. But the Humean project in general, 
we can think of as one long and sustained critique of a number of features of lock-in or contractarian uh, liberal political thought. Um, uh, so I'm going to assume you have at least some passing familiarity um, with uh, Hume's discussion in the treatise, but if not, I'm going to try to summarize it in just a couple of minutes. So Hume's basic position in the treatise, um, or at least in the sections on property or the sections on justice, is that Locke and others within the um, natural jurisprudential contractarian traditions more generally, that they assume far too much. Um, that they assume far too much about the institutional features of everyday life. And in particular, Hume thinks, if we take a look at the institution of property, we can see not just an example of an important institution where they assume too much, but how they go about assuming too much or how they go about, you might say, helping themselves um, to institutions that we have no reason to think might exist in nature. So Hume just basically looks at, at you know, human cognition, human motivation and says, where is this thing called justice? Where is just behavior? Where is the virtue of justice? Is it naturally occurring? Like, do babies come out of the womb um, knowing what justice is, having some inkling about justice, having some intuition that one ought to preserve rights and property in oneself and in those around oneself? And Hume's basic position is that no, this is not the case. Um, that justice, um, justice understood as fidelity to the rules of contract and of property more generally. That justice has to be learned. Right? We have to teach children um, how to conform themselves to the rules and norms that um, uh, are associated with property. And we ourselves, over time, we ourselves considered as a as a society or as um, as a civilization. We have to develop these norms. Locke, if you recall from the second treatise, assumes that many of these are in some sense already in place. Right? So if we look at in particular chapter five of the second treatise, Locke's position seems to be that any reasonable person, um, anyone who will but consult their reason can see that the earth was given to men in common. Right. So on the one hand, there's a, a scriptural basis for this, but there's also it seems to be some kind of common sense, rational basis for this view that the earth is given to men in common, that we have been obligated to preserve ourselves. We talked about that last time. That in order to preserve ourselves, we have to have some means by which we can remove from the commons um, uh, uh, stuff that we need to survive. Right? In other words, we, need have to, we have to have a way of taking things that are in the common stock and making them our own private property in some way. And that the way to do that is by mixing our labor with it. So if I go up to an apple tree um, and I pick an apple, right? even if the apple tree itself is in common, in doing the labor necessary to remove part of the apple tree to make it useful to myself, I have thereby mixed the property that I have in my person with the apple tree and I can come to um, possess the apple. And Locke wants to be clear that this possession, this right of possession, this natural right of private property does not depend um, on it being acknowledged by those around me, right? I don't need to ask everyone else around me. I don't need to check with everyone else. Is it okay if I take this apple? I have to preserve myself, right? I'm obligated to God to do that. And I have to have stuff in order to preserve myself. Therefore, I must have some method of making use of the world around me. And again, the important things, <clears throat> the important thing to keep in mind here is that for Locke, this process, this uh, uh, moral process, this process through which one might come upon a claim to stuff, it's natural and it's rooted in our reason. Uh, in some places, Locke says that reason is the law of nature. In other places, he seems to suggest that reason is the tool by which we interpret the law of nature. Either way, it's natural and it's rational. It's already there, it already exists, it's written on our hearts, and all we have to do is consult our reason and recognize that a natural right in property exists. Um, Hume begins with the assumption that this and a number of other, um, you might say institutions that Locke helps himself to, that this is simply not true, that we have no reason to think um, that property exists naturally. So instead what Hume suggests is that what we might do is we might identify a kind of slow organic evolutionary process whereby human beings acting in ways consistent with 
a relatively fine-tuned and nuanced understanding of human nature, find a way where human beings acting only upon their, what we might call natural intuitions or natural instincts, will nonetheless over time adopt in various ways, depending on the context, adopt the rules and customs that we now refer to as property, right? So in other words, for Hume, we are faced with a number of challenges by nature, right? We're faced with the fact that we are all of us, each of us selfish, right? We prefer ourselves and our own small tribes to those around us. Combined with the selfishness, we have the facts of natural scarcity, right? And Hume thinks that natural scarcity is in some sense a permanent feature of human life. Even if we all have enough to eat, there'll still be scarcity with regards to finer and finer foods and other material goods. And then the fact that we live in societies, right? So in other words, we have a lot of selfish people living in close proximity in continual contact with one another. And on top of that, there are uh, conditions of material scarcity. So if you put these three things together, what you're gonna find is that people acting only on their self-interest, seeking only to be more secure in their own claims will eventually, right, over time, through a series of repeated interactions with others, or repeated conflicts with others, they will eventually come to um, an agreement. Right? If you mind your stuff, I'll mind my stuff. If I can feel safe in my stuff, I'm willing to let you feel safe in your stuff. And a series of increasingly complicated agreements will grow slowly over time uh, to deal with this. In other words, property for humans is something that's learned. Um, and not only that, property isn't rational. It isn't available to us merely by consulting our reason, right? No one sitting by their fireplace and twirling wax between their fingers is going to alight upon the notion of property. It has to be, um, in some sense, uh, uh, it has to be conjured up as a, as, a, uh, as a solution to problems, right? We have to experience the insecurity uh, that goes along with not having property in order to adopt the practices. Uh, that we refer to as property. So if you're interested in, what, again, what I consider to be a, just a really nice illustration of how conservatism grows out of um, skepticism regarding um, liberal approaches to, uh, to uh, or I should say Lockean and contractarian approaches to institutions, really focus on those passages from Hume's uh, treatise uh, as a place to start. So from that, what can we say about Conservative. If we had to have a program, a uh, conservative program, um, I, I would put it in, in these ways, uh, in, in, this, in the following way. I would say that the first thing that uh, we can place in this box, conservatism, is a certain skepticism regarding reason. Um, and I want to be clear here. Uh, if you're familiar with the conservative literature at all, you know that conservatives are skeptical about, skeptical regarding reason, and you also know they're skeptical regarding rationalism. And these are two different things. So I want to start with a certain skepticism about reason. What I mean by a skepticism about reason is a kind of thoroughgoing skepticism about the role of reason within what we might think of as the life of the mind. Right? So a thoroughgoing skepticism in its capacity to motivate people to behave in certain ways. Um, so if we look at Locke in the second treatise, if we look at Jefferson and a number of other French 18th century figures representative of, of um, you know, the so-called enlightenment or the so-called high enlightenment, right, we can see um, certain assumptions about human behavior. Right? So human behavior in some way will appear rational. Reason will play um, a motivating role in the life of individuals. And not only that, but at the level of what we might think of as the species or the society, human behavior will become increasingly rational as religion and other forms of ignorance uh, are slowly dispelled. Um, so that we can think of as um, uh, a certain triumphant account uh, or a triumphal account of the role of reason in individual behavior. And the thing that we think of as conservatism begins as a skepticism towards that. So if we look at figures like Hume uh, or uh, one of my own favorites, if we look at a figure like Montaigne, um, whose uh, essays are, um, you know, one of the um, uh, most magnificent uh, monuments uh, to skepticism and uh, in particular uh, a kind of uh, literary appreciation for the limits of human reason in everyday life. Uh, 
right? What Montaigne and what Hume um, thought in response to this sort of high enlightenment emphasis on reason is that human beings aren't particularly rational. Um, that reason does not motivate us, um, that uh, reason serves only to help us get what we want, but that for the most part, our wants, our desires, our passions um, operate on their own. Um, and not only that, but our, uh, our heart or our passions are um, often quite durably resistant um, to control by reason. Right? It's not only, in other words, not only are our inner lives not particularly rational, but our inner lives are themselves highly resistant to reason. Right? We, we don't order our emotional lives according to what a rational person ought to. We don't behave in the way that a rational person ought to. We are uh, finicky and fickle and uh, passionate creatures and we're led to be swept away at various points by various things. And we have biases and we have prejudices and none of these things can be um, done away with. None of these things can be eliminated, no matter how many textbooks we read. So conservatism begins, in other words, with a skepticism about human behavior and whether or not human behavior can be described as rational. Related to this is a second thing, uh, what we can call skepticism regarding rationalism. And I want to be clear, rationalism and reason are, are different. Rationalism um, is obviously related to reason, or I should say anti-rationalism is obviously related to anti-reason, um, uh, but it has more to do with sort of relative levels of competence when it comes to understanding and maybe more importantly, controlling large and complex systems, uh, economies and states being two obvious examples of large and complex systems. Right? So anti-reason or skepticism regarding reason has to do with the role of reason in regulating our conduct, or the relatively limited role of reason in regulating our conduct. But rationalism uh, has to do with human beings. Can they understand, what, right? that is, can they understand it in such a way that they might be led to believe they can just control large and complex institutions, right? Something like the state. Can we hold it in our minds? Can we um, theorize about the state? Um, can we control the state? Can we control something as complex as society? Uh, can we control something as complex as an economy? Right? This is rationalism, the view that these systems are themselves systematic enough or uh, empirically legible enough to be properly understood and controlled by human minds. The conservatives or conservatives in general tend to be highly skeptical uh, regarding uh, this case. Now, anti-rationalism itself, I think, comes in at least two varieties within the conservative uh, tradition. There's the anti-rationalism of somebody like Hayek. Um, so uh, I suspect that many in the audience today are familiar with uh, Hayek's work, in particular Hayek's work um, on um, the dispersion of knowledge uh, throughout society, right? So on the one hand, what Hayek brings to the table is uh, insights into the way that relevant knowledge is um, dispersed, right? Dispersed across, uh, dispersed across people, and not only dispersed across people, but dispersed across time, right? So the subjective information about value that you would need to run a centralized economy, right? It's available only at the level of the individual, but not only that, it seems to be available only at the level of the individual at particular times, right? My subjective preferences might actually change day to day, and even I don't really know what this is going to look like. So for Hayek, the problem is that um, syst large-scale systems themselves aren't legible, that they can't um, be properly uh, uh, collated um, and therefore can't be controlled, or at least disaster will result when you try to control them. But we also have anti-rationalism in the shape of somebody like Oakeshott, uh, Michael Oakeshott, the 20th century British philosopher. Uh, with Oakeshott, rationalism is, is somewhat different. It's, it's the application of sort of principles or approaches that might be appropriate to one domain um, uh, to another domain. In Oakeshott in particular, if you read his, um, his essays in his large collection of essays on rationalism, which is available from uh, Liberty Fund, I think it's free, on, maybe it is a free online. Um, but there's some excellent essays in there on his view on rationalism. And essentially for Oakeshott, uh, he thinks that science has taken, um, I'm sorry, he thinks that politics has taken on the methods 
and the vocabulary of science, science or a vocabulary that he thinks is totally uh, inappropriate for uh, practical questions. Okay, so we have these two things, skepticism regarding reason, skepticism regarding rationalism. From these two things, I think you get a third thing, which is probably the thing that's most recognizable as conservatism, um, which is a skepticism regarding uh, change, right? So normally when we think of conservatism, we think in particular about an unwillingness to change. Uh, if we think of, for example, the masthead of National Review, right? So National Review, the Amer American conservative magazine, the, you know, the brainchild of William F. Buckley, uh, Frank Meyer and all these guys on their masthead they've had for, you know, however many years, 70 years, standing athwart history and yelling stop. Right? So in this case, what we have is a very self-conscious conservatism, which sees the course of the world as being a slow progress, right, or a slow decline. And it's the role of conservatives, the job of conservatives to view this change with, with fear and with skepticism and to stop it from occurring. Um, I think that's basically wrong. Uh, I don't think that view is particularly conservative. And I think actually it's precisely uh, figures like Buckley that have gotten the American right into a lot of trouble in the last 70 years. So let me say a couple of things about what I mean when I say the conservatives are skeptical about change. On the one hand, um, we have um, the conservative tendency to uh, take the skepticism regarding reason, or take the skepticism regarding rationalism and to say, well, listen, if, if I'm limited in terms of understanding large systems, and if I'm limited even in terms of understanding myself, then how do I identify practices, methods, ways of living? How do I identify ones that work and which ones don't work? In other words, how do I select uh, between uh, various options uh, in terms of the best path to proceed if I can't really understand anything? And the conservative answer to this question tends to be something like, if we can't trust individuals living at a particular time and in a particular place to make effective large scale of evaluations of complex systems, then we can look to institutions themselves as in some sense, storehouses of wisdom. So if we look at you know, the conservative approach to something like the English common law, right? So what is the English common law? It's this you know, millennial, um, millennium of slow, deliberate decision-making um, on the part of judges and plaintiffs that evolve slowly over time to meet new challenges, but on the whole can be regarded as a kind of storehouse of wisdom, a kind of artificial reason that we can avail ourselves of. And if you wanna see which ways of life work, right? which ways of doing things work, which practices are themselves effective, just look around and see what people are doing and see, um, uh, uh, which institutions they adopt. And once we've identified these, right, we're gonna be hesitant to change them. So that's the first thing is um, a skepticism regarding change because of a kind of profound respect for institutions as themselves storehouses of wisdom. But secondly, and I think this is actually much more importantly, it's important to note, and this is what I usually start my discussions of conservatism with, it's important to note that conservatives are not on principle opposed to change itself. In fact, conservatives were some of the first to recognize that change, not progress, there is a difference between change and progress, right? Whereas we can say that um, liberals in the high enlightenment tradition have a certain faith in progress. And in fact, I think if you spend any time on Twitter, you can see that, the, that this attitude towards progress, that the arc of history is in fact an art um, and that it's ineluctable. Um, this, I think, I think this attitude is, is uh, part and parcel of what we mean by liberalism. I think conservatives reject this, or at least they're highly skeptical of the idea of ineluctable progress towards a, um, a final end, but they don't deny change. Um, and when I say this, I, I mean it. I mean, if you go and you look at it, you know, Burke's, um, uh, Reflections on the Revolution, which is itself kind of the ur text of conservatism. I mean, Burke has this lovely line, a state without the means of some change is without the means of its conservation. Um, for Burke, um, what conservative politics was, uh, was an attempt not to uh, arrest change, right? Not to stop change or halt change or to stand athwart history yelling stop, 
but was rather to change well. Right? How do I uh, identify which institutions are good? How do we identify which institutions we'd like to preserve and which we'd like to jettison? Uh, what Burke called, um, and he often made use of this metaphor of doctors, what he called the peccant part, um, that part of um, the animal or the organism which needs to be done away with. Um, uh, many conservatives have used this um, metaphor, this idea of, you know, uh, essentially, uh, um, um, <laughs> my words are currently, what's it called? We remove a body part. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> that thing where you cut a part of the body off. You don't cut a part of the body off in order to kill um, the body. Um, amputate. <laughs> the word I was looking for was that highly jargony technical term amputate. Uh, you don't amputate a leg or an arm in order to kill the body. You amputate a leg or an arm to save the body. And for Burke, the role of the politician was, prop was precisely to use a lifetime of knowledge about politics and about institutions to identify the peccant part, to identify what needed to be amputated in order to preserve the health and life of the general body. So um, conservatism, again, understood as this tradition of Montaigne, Hume, Burke, Oakeshott, um, uh, Hayek, Scruton, is not anti-change. Um, rather, it's, it's much more concerned with uh, change via uh, discrimination. Right? We want to be discriminant about the way in which we change. We want to be discriminant about, um, or sorry, we want to be discriminating about uh, which institutions we choose to change and in what ways. So conservatism is not anti-change. In fact, it recognizes change as um, an ineradicable feature of, of life, of political life. Um, and it seeks to change well. Now, from these three things, these three forms of skepticism, you see conservative thinkers in various ways uh, sort of begin with these and then take it off in a more what we might think of as a positive direction. Uh, so for example, cons uh, conservatives have um, often uh, talked about liberal society as a society which encourages individualism. And they've expressed a certain skepticism about individualism, individualism considered as a kind of ontology, right, a way of being um, in the world. And so conservatives have often pointed out that individuals are not, not to rehash the communitarian debates of the 80s and 90s, but individuals are not disembodied, rational uh, minds floating above institutions. Rather, individuals are always and already within some community. Right? In other words, an individual is a thing that's determined by uh, what's come before it, by the uh, institutions that it was raised in. Um, and not only that, but individuals going forward uh, are always constrained by the societies in which um, they live. So they tend to focus, in other words, on community as not just a source for meaning, but community as the locus of social scientific uh, endeavors. So in other words, if you're somebody like Burke, right, you um, aren't particularly interested in this thing called man, right, or in this thing called human nature and the sorts of governments that this thing called man corresponding with the theory of human nature might produce. What you're interested in is Englishmen, uh, Englishmen and women, people who have been in some sense shaped by this thing called in, uh, England, uh, who carry with them an identity of being English and who are therefore only likely to select those um, institutional forms that befit an English person. Right? So they tend to focus a lot on, on community. Um, uh, they tend to focus a lot on meaning and the way uh, that meaning orients people's lives and about the dangers of depriving individuals of the sources of meaning. They often focus on associations, uh, right? So because they're in such a, a search for community and for meaning, they often focus on, focus on associations as not only uh, uh, sources of meaning or contexts in which life um, takes on meaning, but they also tend to be pluralists in that they can look at a variety of associations and identify good lives lived in various different ways. Right? In other words, if it's not the case that all lives have to conform with some universal or rational conception of good life, then there are many different good lives available to us, and there are many different associational contexts in which such a life can be pursued. 
They tend to be deeply opposed to the use of arbitrary power, arbitrary power understood in the way that somebody like Burke and somebody like Acton understood it. That is to say, power divorced from an institutional setting. Um, uh, claiming the right to use power indiscriminately, claiming the right to use power to get rid of institutions or to uh, run roughshod over an institutional framework. This is something that conservatives are universally opposed to. Um, and if you, if you take all these things uh, together, I think actually what, what we find I think in the conservative tradition is, uh, is a search for how one can be at home in the world. And what I mean by at home in the world is how one can uh, combine, on the one hand, the liberatory message of, or the liberatory drive in the liberal tradition with a more, you might call it, realistic um, uh, focus um, on the actual conditions under which uh, people, in which people live. Which is simply to say that I think that conservatism understood in this way, understood as the tradition of Montaigne and Burke and Hume and Scruton and um, all these guys. I think that this is not in any way, shape or form incompatible with liberalism. Uh, in fact, I think it's a needed, it's a necessary complement uh, to the liberal project. If liberalism has within it this drive to liberate, and this is what we talked about last time, um, right? I think if we understand liberalism as containing within it this obligation to liberate, liberate ourselves and liberate others around us, then you know, right, this drive to liberate reaches its climax in a figure like Marx, for whom we have to be liberated from ourselves, right, from our own consciousness, uh, which has been um, produced in us by um, the relations of power uh, that exist around us. I mean, ultimately, I think what conservatives can suit to do, what conservatives, uh, what conservatism can do is to pump the brakes on this liberatory project. Um, it can temper uh, this liberatory project. It, it can represent the wisdom necessary to properly temper the project of liberation with an appreciation for home and for being at home um, in uh, the world. So that's the thing called conservatism. And if, I mean, if I haven't made it clear by now, I, I think this is, uh, I think there's a lot to this. Um, um, I think it has a lot to recommend it. Um, I think that many of the figures that classical liberals and libertarians want to bring into the liberal tradition, figures like Hume and Adam Smith and Benjamin Constant and Tocqueville and others, I think that many of them um, can uh, uh, be brought into the liberal tradition and have it serve only to enrich uh, our liberal vocabulary or our liberal understanding of the institutions um, that, uh, um, that uh, make a liberal way of life possible. That's conservatism. Reaction is, in many ways, is the opposite. Uh, it's the opposite of all these things. And I actually think that reaction sort of begins with this last point, this point of being at home in the world and works its, its, its way backwards through this discussion that we've just had about skepticism regarding various features of liberal thought. So what do I mean by reaction? I mean, we live in an age of reaction in some ways. I don't, I mean, there's no way to really quantify and say that this age is more reactionary than previous. Um, Ages. But I would actually place a number of sort of new figures or new contenders to the reactionary throne within this camp. So if you have, you know, the alt-right figures like um, Mincius Moldbug, um, who now goes by his real name, though I can't remember what it is, or the so-called Bronze Age perverts, right? So in other words, the online alt-right movement. But even if we look at the kind of thick conservative of figures like Patrick Deneen at Notre Dame, um, uh, Catholic integralists, uh, if you look at the Benedictine option of Rod Dreher, and I think ultimately if you look at a figure like uh, Trump, itself, uh, Trump himself and Trumpism more generally, to whatever extent Trumpism is an articulated, which is to say a kind of conscious and deliberate ideology, I think they do have this one thing in common, even if you know, the kind of high integralism of Adrian Vermeule seems to have nothing in common with Trump. I do think they have this in common, and that is that they reject modernity itself, which is to say that, like Marx, what reactionaries have in common, I'm sorry, what, yeah, like Marx, what reactionaries have in common, what binds them together is the view that we can never be at home in this world, um, that the world that emerged uh, in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, the world of what we might call liberal modernity, 
uh, is one in which good life, the good life cannot be lived. And in fact, if there's one thing that I think figures like Deneen um, and others get wrong, get consistently wrong, get wrong in ways that make you question the validity of the entire project, is the tendency to describe modernity as liberalism. Uh, or the tendency to confuse, sometimes I think unconsciously, but sometimes quite de deliberately, all things modern, i.e. all things that characterize life after 1600 with a political ideology that can be accurately described as liberal. And so if modernity is something like the following, uh, this is the, the following I take to be a kind of laundry list of things about modernity, uh, secularism, um, industrial capitalism, uh, displacement of communities, uh, a reliance on technology, and not only that, but um, widespread adoption of various technologies, increasingly lax attitudes, or we might say increasingly um, uh, morally lax from a traditional perspective, attitudes regarding sexuality, uh, um, increasingly unorthodox views regarding uh, gender and sex uh, and race, right? I mean, you can just all these things that I named, right? If you pay any attention to what now passes for right intellectual commentary, uh, and in particular, right or what we might call cultural, culturally conservative commentary, these are the things that they identify, right? They have generally little to say about, um, you know, I guess property rights um, or the separation of powers or anything like this. And often, actually, they describe themselves as the true defenders of separation of powers or various other institutional mechanisms. But that's not where their focus is. Um, in fact, if you spend any time in the cultural uh, um, intellectual spheres, uh, what's remarkable is that they actually seem to be speaking a different kind of language in terms of what they identify as wrong with the world. Um, uh, for example, the uh, incredible uh, uh, focus on um, anti, um, uh, anti trans uh, um, rhetoric, right? So, um, Right, the, uh, the idea that you can respond to pretty much any claim about the world, any um, uh, unorthodox claim about the world by simply asserting that there are in fact two genders, right? What does the number of genders have at all to do with conservatism? What does it have at all to do with, um, you know, our limited capacity to understand complex systems and all this kind of stuff? I mean, what's obvious to anyone is that it has nothing at all to do with it. Uh, much of what we think of today as conservatism is, in fact, a reaction against this thing called modernity. And much of what it represents is a complete total refusal um, to think creatively, to think deliberately about life in the modern age and what um, marks life in the modern age is distinct from the others. Which is to say, and I can't underline this strongly enough, if you look at the project of a 21st century conservative like Roger Scruton, and this he says explicitly, Conservatism is about, it's not about repudiation. This is a line that he uses to describe um, the work of T.S. Eliot. Um, it's not about repudiation, it's about reconciliation. But reaction is precisely a matter of repudiation, right? Reaction is precisely a matter of uh, saying no um, to the world um, as it exists, to the world around us. It sees decline and corruption everywhere. Um, and so reaction in some sense, because it rejects modernity, it has to imagine. It always begins with some imagined time, some imagined place where uh, things are not like this. So whether it's about a kind of voluntary withdrawal from the world in the case of Dreyer's uh, Benedictine option, or in the case of sort of mid 20th century um, discussions of you know, the remainder um, or you know the recalcitrant minority who refused to go along with the welfare state and all this kind of stuff. There's always this idea of, of leaving, of, of uh, self-exile, um, of removing oneself from this tidal wave of modernity. But I mean, just to put, a, I guess, a, a finer point on it, it's also about making America great again, right? When was America great? I mean, who knows, the 60s, the 70s, the 40s? The third, I mean, uh, what about America was great? We don't know. All we know is that it was great. It's not great any longer. We seem to think quite loosely that it might have to do with um, whether or not we acknowledge the existence of transgender people. 
Um, we seem to think that it has something to do with uh, the status of gay marriage. Um, uh, we seem to think that it has something to do with you know, the global economy, but we don't really know. All we know is that things used to be good and things are no longer good. And that what we must do now is not to stand athwart history and yell stop. What we must do now is not to, um, to uh, you know, exercise only the peccant part, is not to use our discriminating eye to draw on a lifetime of experience to identify those institutions that can be changed and to change them well. Uh, what must be done is to turn back the clock. Right? We must go back to the time uh, where men were men and um, women were uh, women. It goes without saying that reactionaryism or reaction isn't conservative. It's radical in every imaginable way. It rejects entirely um, the notion that we can that we that we don't really know that we can't really understand complex systems. Right. In fact. Right. The whole appeal of Trumpism is that in some sense, the knowledge, the know-how gained in the business world can be applied to great success in the political world. Right? That politics is so simple that even a complete um, and total, uh, 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 you know, someone with absolutely no political experience whatsoever can come in and write the ship. Um, there's nothing whatsoever conservative about it. Uh, reaction and in fact its initial impulse it's it's uh the animating spirit of it is deeply anti-conservative in almost every imaginable way is it anti-liberal yes it obviously is why because it rejects again it rejects this distinction between society or liberal association understood as a university toss versus as it's understood as a society um right whether it comes in the form of nationalism whether it comes comes in the form of cultural conservatism whether it comes in the form of kind of high Catholic integralism, right? It sees as the problem, um, the fact that we are in some sense too free to live life as we, as we see fit, that uh, what is needed is something altogether more than civil society, than the disinterested rules that allow us to live together. What's needed is, you know, a new commission on federal education uh, that will give our children uh, patriotic uh, that will instill in our children patriotic values and ultimately uh, teach them how many genders there are. Um, and so it's with that that I will conclude my uh, remarks. All right, Professor Turner, thank you. So uh, as you can imagine, we have uh, quite a few uh, really good questions. The first one, uh, um, I think we could describe it as pushing back a little bit on the uh, neatness in fit between conservatism as described by conservatives, self-described conservatives, and liberalism. So uh, the question notes, social conservatives have blocked racial rights, gay rights, and so on. Economic conservatives, and I might add that uh, I'll, uh, I'm curious if you think that these are meaningful categories, social conservatives, economic conservatives. Uh, so you might say something about that. Um, economic conservatives work to block social safety nets that protect individualism and things like that. So are there tensions between conservatism in the sense that it gets described in modern political discourse and liberalism more generally? Uh, so uh, when it comes to economic versus cultural conservatism, I actually would like to see these things split. I think that um, the way that we talk about that has is largely, it's actually worked its way up into the intellectual sphere from the political fusionism of the 50s and 60s. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think there's actually major differences between what we think of as economic conservatism, um, which I un understand to be just something like uh, a thick respect for property rights, a preference for free markets um, and at both the domestic and global scale. I, I think that what that has in common with cultural conservatism, with cultural conservatism is almost nothing, right? So you could imagine an argument, which I mean, I've heard before and you probably heard before that goes something like this without, you know, respect for religious values, without, you know, a church going population, we're, we're all going to become communists or whatever, right? So in other words, one of the ways that we associate these two is to think that our respect for uh, private property rights, our respect for free markets is in some sense undergirded by 
um, uh, you know, a kind of moral character that's instilled uh, in ways that cultural conservatives want to identify. There's very little empirical evidence to suggest that's true. Um, and I don't see any ideological reason to think that that's, uh, that that's true at all. Uh, in fact, I mean, if you look historically, the evolution of property rights and the evolution of religion or whatever, I mean, these things almost never move in tandem. So I don't think economic and cultural conservative have much to do with each other. I think one of them tends to be conservative and the other one tends to be reactionary. When it comes to the, the um, uh, points of tension, I mean, yes, there are definitely points of tension. And again, this goes back to what I said at the beginning. I mean, liberalism has within it tensions. Um, you could imagine uh, two parties um, in, um, that, that are themselves really and truly opposed, right? Not just variations on a theme, but two opposed parties, uh, both of which could be considered liberal, right? So um, uh, in other words, a, a, a party of something like liberation, um, which uh, might adopt the view that um, economic welfareism is uh, needed uh, for the full scale liberation of individuals. And then you might imagine a liberal party that is more conservative in the way that I've described here. I think those are both perfectly fine. Something like um, the adoption of policies that systematically disenfranchise minorities in various ways. I mean, wh what is there to be said for this? It's a violation, again, of, it's a violation of the idea of liberal association, right? It violates the basic commitment to something like civil equality um, in that it denies participation in um, the civic sphere, the civil sphere to those, to those minority. It bars them from certain political and economic uh, practices. And so th those are liberal as a matter of course. And therefore, it's unsurprising that uh, cultural conservatism and these efforts seem to often go hand in hand um, in reality. A related question is, uh, asks for your opinion on the relationship between conservatism and classical liberalism. Are, uh, is there some relationship of cooperation and alliance between these two possible? Are, are they closer than perhaps liberalism more generally? I mean, I think, I think that they're basically related. Uh, I mean, and not just related, I mean, I think you could not maybe use the words interchangeably, but I mean, I could imagine identifying myself as a classical liberal in one context and a conservative in another context, um, because at some level it depends on the question. Uh, it depends on the question that's being asked. It depends on what kind of liberalism we're interested in talking about at this particular time, right? If we're interested in questions of authority and legitimacy, for example, I would probably describe myself as classically liberal in some, in some sense. If we're talking about, um, um, uh, you know, uh, the role of private property in uh, defending individual liberty, I think I might actually describe myself as conservative. And I can see vice versa. In other words, I don't, I don't see any, um, reason to let uh, these, these matters of vocabulary do our thinking for us. So on this account, is, is liberalism uh, sort of the broad tent and conservatism acting as uh, the, the part to the right that still counts as liberalism under the tent? I mean, I, I think so, yeah. I mean, that's, again, this is maybe my own idiosyncratic view. I think that yeah, I, so in other words, I think there's two claims that I'm making here, both of which I'm willing to defend and both of which I think I have defended. One is that conservatism and reaction, though they're both often grouped together on this thing called the right, are not in fact together and that they are in fact um, almost diametrically opposed to one another. That's one thing. I think that's right and I think I've given the reasons why that's the case. The looser claim is that I think, yeah, conservatism is, I think it's, it, it is, a, is a thing and I've actually gone back and forth over what kind of thing it is. I'm not sure, attitude or ideology, something in between there. I think it's more of an approach, um, whatever that adds. Um, but that is, it's a thing that fits within the liberal tent, yeah. I think that most people reading, you know, reading Burke and Acton and Tocqueville, I mean, I think most of them um, can manage to live their lives uh, without thinking that something is, uh, you know, deeply wrong with the world around them, whereas a reactionary by definition cannot. And I think that's what really distinguishes illiberal, uh, the illiberal right from the liberal right is, um, can you be on board with modernity, 
Um, and to the extent that uh, liberal democracy tends to be that political system that uh, has been uh, adopted in by modern nation states. I mean, I think these these tend to go hand in hand. I think reactionaries reject these. It seems like one division that you might be drawing is between the theory of conservatism, I'm guessing through folks like Oakshot and uh, Burke, um, and conservatism in practice in the ways that it works out with Buckley at all. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, and, and I think that American conservatism in particularly is, is wedded in strange ways um, in this way. I mean, you know, National Review is a good example, whereas National Review, you know, I, and I don't mean this as an insult, but National Review was always pseudo-intellectual. I mean, especially if you look at the masthead from back in the 60s and 70s, I mean, there were some real luminaries on there, guys like Frank Meyer, um, uh, um, uh, 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 Robert Nisbet, I mean, all, I mean, all, uh, Russell Kirk, who actually had some, you know, didn't, didn't really fit in with the, in our, with the National Review crowd. But then at the same time, you know, Buckley's project was explicitly po political, right? So for Buckley, National Review or the intellectual side of the movement was almost always in service of some broader political project. And I want to be perfectly clear about this, right? If cons American conservatism is Buckleyism, then it has been opposed to civil rights, for example, from the very beginning. Uh, it has been... Um, you know, deeply, deeply embedded in American political institutions of white supremacy since its very founding. I think it can be separated out. It's maybe no surprise, I think, that many of the figures that I want to draw in and I want to champion as examples of a good kind of conservatism or British. Um, but I think there are some Americans, uh, guys like Robert Penn Warren. Um, uh, most of them actually would be uh, author Mark Twain, I think actually I would put into this category and a few other ones. Um, uh, uh, Keeks, no, Keeks is an American. He's like Hungarian or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's a problem that this this good version of conservatism that I think is valuable seems to have no American practitioners. But, um, you know, you got to start somewhere. Oh, Lincoln. Lincoln, I think, would fit nicely into this category. I mean, Lincoln seemed to have a kind of intuitive um, grasp for this kind of thing. So we've had so many good questions. We haven't had time to get to probably half of them. So if we haven't gotten to your question, I would encourage you to come next week for the final session. It will be a conversation and an extended Q&A. So feel free to bring those questions then and you'll have a chance to pose them to Professor Turner. So our last question is, how does con contemporary right-wing populism fit into this schema? Is it just reactionism or is it something different? I mean, my own view is that it's mostly reaction. Um, and I think uh, populist movements will almost always tend to be um, illiberal um, in attitude. Um, so, I mean, very rarely, for example, do we have strong populist movements whose primary feature is an appreciation for the institutions that comprise something like the separation of powers, for example. Very rarely do we have populist movements for judicial restraint. Very rarely do we have populist movements animated by a deep and abiding love for the common law and the tradition that it represents. Um, uh, I mean, the very essence of populism is something like, um, we're tired of the rules, uh, we're tired of the current distribution of power and we want to see it change. So they tend, uh, the movements tend to be radical. Um, they tend to be uh, demagogic. Um, uh, right, and this goes back. I mean, this goes back to uh, Rome and to Greece. Uh, populist movements are almost always led by uh, single figures, and these single figures themselves, and Trump is no exception to this, they thrive um, in atmospheres where they can be seen breaking rules. Uh, they can be seen acknowledging and uh, uh, slandering uh, institutions and uh, rules and informal norms. And most importantly, they draw their power from their capacity and their willingness to break them. Um, and so, no, I don't think populism and conservatism go together. And in fact, I think if anything, conservatism ought, ought to serve as a kind of um, a break uh, or an invitation to rise above um, uh, populism and the sort of common sense uh, intuitions that often animate it.